This is Digital Music Trends, episode 146, on the 21st of August 2013. This week on the show, Germany's recorded music revenues increase, iTunes Radio lines up ad partners, Daisy's playlist guidelines, Gaga's applause, Ardio's stations, and lots more. This week's show is sponsored by Sheridan's at sheridan's.co.uk. Welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as both audio and video on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker and Stitcher. To get in touch with the show, the email is contact at digitalmusictrends.com. Feel free to interact and send your comments uh, on the stories that we'll talk about today. For example, I would love to read a couple of them next week. And I'm really happy to introduce uh, today my guests and first up is uh, Andy Malt from CMU complete music update which you can find on the cmu website.com and hi andy great to have you on the show how's it going today hi i'm going very well thank you it's great to have you on and also uh, with us today is adam webb a freelance writer and pr consultant great to have you on the show adam how's it going i'm very well thank you andre Awesome. Well, uh, we're going to start off today by talking about Germany and uh, some good news for once uh, in the form of a 1.5% increase in recorded music sales in the first half of 2013 compared to the same period in 2012. So this is according to the numbers reported by the Bundesverband Music Industry or simply BAV BVMI, which is the Federal Association of Music Industry in Germany. Uh, digital grew 16%, which is pretty good, and now represents 24.5% of the overall recorded music market. Downloads made up 20 percent of that but only grew just uh, uh, over five percent year on year whilst the streaming services which only make up 4.5 percent of the overall market actually doubled year on year so that's uh, a good indication of where the market's going what the trend is and uh, cd sales declined 2.7 percent whilst the vinyl increased the 30 percent year on year and now represents 1.8 percent of the overall market so pretty good news uh, all in all and it points to the resilience of the physical market in germany but also to the much wanted story of digital making up for the gradual decline of cd sales and Adam, Germany is a very particular market in the sense that uh, it still places a lot of, impo of importance on physical and on CDs. Uh, and uh, how important is this step, in your opinion, of seeing uh, uh, digital finally offset the, the physical decline? Uh, I think it's it's obviously I mean it's obviously important. I mean I think that the German market seems to be operating about probably about sort of one or two years behind the say the UK market yeah. um, in that a lot of the streaming services I think Spotify only arrived in March last year and um, uh, ditto with with RDO and um, and Deezer and obviously they've got services like Symphony as well so so it's a slightly it's a slightly I guess it's a slightly different market and I know there's been issues with gamer and licensing as well which has maybe sort of held some of the streaming market back um, but I think, I mean, I think one of the important things, obviously, been a lot of focus on on Sweden and Norway, and obviously recently with the Spotify report as well, looking at other countries like the Netherlands. But you know, obviously, the, the underlying thing is that Germans, the German economy in in the context of Europe, is actually a very strong economy at the moment. Um, obviously, it's uh, slightly dependent on 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 the bailouts in, in in other sectors in Southern Europe. But you know, that's that's probably the most important factor as well. You know, it's still yeah. a strong economy. Yeah, absolutely. And Andy, what do you make of the digital trends here? Like we're seeing downloads increasing only marginally, but streaming doubling. Uh, what, what does that mean for you? I think, well, I don't know, like Adam says, it's, it's, it's an interesting market because it does seem to be kind of lagging behind the rest of Europe in a, in a lot of ways. And, I think, and a lot of that is down to kind of gamer being very resistant to license any digital service. I was at a, a digital debate at uh, the Reaper Barn conference uh, uh, three years ago, um, and they had the head of Gamer on a the panel there um, when Spotify was still trying to get licensed, um, and he said on that panel that he would never license Spotify. Now, obviously, he's <laughs> he's uh, he's decided against that uh, now, but uh, and uh, but you know, obviously, in terms of licensing it, it was a long way behind everywhere else, and I think kind of the fact that physical is still strong is because digital hasn't taken off so much yeah. but that sort of artificial um it's just, it, it digital's been held back people are kind of forced into sticking with physical yeah. to an extent like i mean you know like you can't watch music videos on youtube if they're uh, licensed by gamer because gamer blocks them uh which you know it, it's kind of holding back lots of areas of Digital. And it's actually very hard to appeal. I know Digital Music Trends has been banned uh, in Germany <laughs> for uh, at least three weeks now, but I can't quite figure out what the appeals process is for that <laughs> and, and how to get it unblocked. So definitely not using any copyrighted material here. Yeah. And, uh, and so in terms of, uh, um, uh, um, you know, uh, Adam mentioned the uh, 
Spotify report uh, on uh, the Netherlands, for example. And uh, th do you feel like this could be an interesting market where, because it's lagging behind by a couple of years, uh, we can actually see th the the full line of, of where, where it's now and where it's going. And we can actually analyze all the data because we have all, all the opportunities to, to store and analyze that data now instead of actually missing on, on a few years worth of data like could happen for other territories, for example. Yeah, I think that's definitely a, a, a possibility that you can kind of predict where the market will go. Yeah. Again, it depends on kind of how things are licensed Regional and what, factors. what they uh, what what's allowed. But um, certainly at the moment, it does. If if it was kind of if, if it was be brought in line with the rest of Europe in terms of how things are licensed and how things work, yeah. um, you certainly could predict how that market will develop and possibly direct it in a in a more positive way. Because you know, obviously, everywhere else is just kind of doing things and. Yeah. seeing how it works out. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I think these broad brush stats as well, I mean, they're, in, they're interesting, but, you know, obviously a place like Berlin's obviously got a very strong electronic community and it'd be quite interesting to sort of delve in and sort of see what's different in those certain genres as well. I mean, it sort yeah. of it obscures as much as it tells you, I suppose, as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and there was another big story from Germany uh, this week, which was the fact that the, uh, Germany's federal court, court this week decided that Rapid Share, a service that allows users to easily share files and has been blamed for a lot of music piracy, uh, will have to start monitoring uh, external links that lead into files that are stored onto its servers. So that's an interesting take in the sense that, uh, you know, the court didn't make illegal storing a copyrighted file on, on the rapid share servers, uh, but it did make illegal or it, it did uh, ask the company to comply to a takedown policy for external links that lead into copyrighted material that is within its servers. So uh, according to uh, a game app press release uh, after this uh, ruling, uh, you know, they were, of course, over the moon about this and rapid share is deemed to be the world's largest file sharing service and game I believe that 90% of that traffic is, uh, or the files stored on, on, on those services are infringing. So uh, quite an interesting stat there, uh, although I'm not sure what the uh, support is for that. But, uh, uh, you know, in that respect, uh, do you feel like this ruling makes sense from a practical perspective? And, uh, and uh, Andy, what is your take on it? Well, it's interesting because it's... Um I mean, it relates to a previous ruling, and so this is this was Gamer uh, appealing to the German Supreme Court to get a, a previous ruling overturned on this, yeah. uh, and, and have now uh, lost that appeal. Um, so I think it is interesting. I mean, Gamer argues, not Gamer, sorry, Rapporteur argues that they're they're already doing lots to uh, to block illegal content, and they uh, they have teams of people making sure that there's not illegal content being shared. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, in terms of having to block links from other sites, that are, so it's not necessarily blocking illegal content on RapidShare, it's blocking it being linked to from elsewhere, and that's yeah. quite an interesting perspective on, on kind of managing uh, file sharing. Yeah, and I wonder how RapidShare is actually going to implement it. It feels like something that is going to be, on a practical level, relatively difficult to actually... Yeah, because sure, I mean, like, not every link that's coming in is going to be to illegal content. So they need to know what's illegal and yeah. who's linking to that specific content. It's, yeah, it, it seems <laughs> it might be quite difficult. It leaves a, a, few, a few holes in the process, let's say. Like it leaves uh, the hole of uh, identifying infringing files. How do you uh, sever the links to those files? Uh, whether there are opportunities for appeals from users? Uh, uh, so there's a bunch of question marks, essentially, that are linked to this. And it's and I mean, appeals from, appeals from two ends, like, you know, yeah. If if you take something down, you've got you're going to have an appeal from the person who uploaded the content and the site linking to it potentially. Yeah. So that makes everything doubly complicated as well. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting take. Actually, it's an interesting take on on uh, sort of the safe harbor policies and the and the DMCA stuff that's been happening in the states as well. But uh, we'll see how that uh, uh, that evolves. Uh, Adam, did you have any any points on on this particular one? Uh, nothing particularly. Again, although again, you know, I mean, the, the, I was saying before with the with the you know with the commercial market. I mean, Germany seems to be um, you know, again slightly different here compared to, compared to the UK. And again, th th there's obviously a lot of these conversations were maybe going on in the UK sort of two or three years ago. But I think there's much more emphasis now on just simply growing the you know growing the digital market. Yeah. I mean, obviously, this stuff is imp you know it's important, and you need you need a little bit of both of it, as the Spotify report referenced the other week. But um, but yeah. 
I don't know. It's got to be practical, hasn't it, really? So. Yeah, it does, it does have to be practical, but it's going to be interesting to see how, how Rapid Share actually deals with this uh, and how they implement, uh, uh, of course, probably to its bare minimum, the, the, the requests of a court. Uh, but let's move on to talk about Apple. In the midst of a thousand stories about the iPhone release, uh, where uh, Apple seems to have gone to from being the most uh, secure company in terms of uh, not having any leaks to being like a colander of leaks. <laughs> this seems to be leaks uh, left, right and center about the new iPhone. Uh, but uh, uh, rumors aside, uh, as far as the hardware is concerned, uh, AdAge published a relevant story for us, uh, which is uh, on the upcoming iTunes radio launch. So according to AdAge, uh, brand partners have already been lined up for ads and include McDonald's, Nissan, Pepsi and Procter & Gamble. Uh, there's apparently about 12 partners uh, all in all that have, have uh, signed up for the initial release phase and uh, all of these have committed to 12-month campaigns uh, representing ad buys in the tens of millions of dollars. Access oh. to the iTunes radio advertising environment is going to be restricted at launch to these partners in particular up until uh, the end of the year apparently and then from January it's going to open up to more advertisers uh, although there's going to be a minimum uh, uh, spend of a, a million so that's uh, quite a high uh, ad spend as a mi uh, spend as a minimum so uh, we know that the iAds experiment uh, didn't go the way Apple wanted uh, and do you think that uh, this more proven Pandora-like uh, model is going to be likely to succeed uh, Adam what's your take on that uh I don't know whether it's more late to succeed. I mean, I think I think the impact on Pandora will be, you know, will be, um, I guess, the thing to watch. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, unlike when they launched the iTunes Music Store a decade ago, obviously it's a completely different market, and it's, you know, it's it's a very congested market. Um, obviously, great seeing you know, lots of brands, seeing lots of brands going. I mean, it's a very, it's obviously a, a reasonably, well, it's a very mainstream proposition. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, I guess you'd have to start to see the impact when it, you know, when it, when it, you know, when it launches. When I mean, it out, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, even in terms of, you know, iTunes Match, I mean, I'm not quite sure how many. I know it's free to to, to match subscribers, but I don't know how many subscribers there are to match even within the US or something. So exactly, and and iTunes Match is a. Is part of the picture as well because if you are subscribed to iTunes Match, yeah. then you don't have to listen to adverts. Uh, but I, I guess Apple counts on most people not being subscribed, then I should have to listen mm. to the adverts. And, and Andy, well, in terms of uh, the, the number of adverts, so they're talking about uh, an, ad, an audio ad every 15 minutes and, and a video ad every hour. Uh, do you think this is uh, in the realm of possibility and in the realm of what people are willing to withstand as well on the service? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. You know, some people don't find ad, ads as annoying as other people do, yeah. and I think this this seems. I mean, when it, it's different to like ad, ad, advertising on something like Spotify, where it's breaking up, you know, a whole album into sections basically by pu plugging adverts into it, and this is a bit more like, um, you know, like almost like traditional radio, like yeah. you get you know three songs and then an advert. Um, so I think it's possibly people will be more kind of primed. To, to kind of accept. accept accept this how it is, and yeah. obviously, I mean, the other advantage Apple has is that they've got a lot of people plugged into iTunes already. Yeah. Every, every other service, even the Pandora, which obviously is you know, a pretty big service in the US, but they have to attract people away from what they're using elsewhere. Uh, and you know, iTunes is going to say, "This is just a thing that's on your iTunes account you're already using," yeah, um, exactly. and pull people in like that. Yeah, that that'd be pretty. That would be pretty interesting to see what what the uptake is on it. I mean, of course, Apple have botched uh, a, a number of these projects before, uh, coming out with projects that weren't quite fully baked. But apparently, the 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 momentum is there for them to have you know had enough time to work on this. You know, they've had a few years now to to work out what they want to do in the streaming space. So hopefully, they will come out with a with a with a working uh, with a working service. And uh, uh, Adam, from from your perspective, uh, do you feel like it's a hindrance for Apple to have stuck to these big major corporations as partners because of course that rules out any opportunity for uh, personalization of the adverts as well you know if, if, if you if you yeah. were opening to more potential advertisers then you'd be able to target your your, your adverts uh, better whilst here you only have probably about 12 and everybody's going to get the same ones I guess yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess you know, I mean, Apple's obviously a big mainstream brand. They're you know, they're big, big mainstream brands. They're associated with. I mean, it's. Um, um, I mean, I guess I agree that maybe you would have expected a bit more innovation there in terms of targeting people or localization or, or something like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, it's 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 you know, it's so hard to tell you know quite how it will be received until it until it's out there. I yeah. mean, I guess. You know, it's not going to be until you pass a building site and you hear people, um, you hear builders um, tuning into Apple Radio rather than <laughs> Radio One or something. That that's you know that'll be the seismic moment maybe or something. But 
I don't know. <laughs> It'll take a while, won't it? Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, and of course, you know, we probably won't be able to use it uh, until uh, way past uh, September, because uh, uh, f- as far as I remember, that I think the initial launch is going to be US sure. only, and then it's going to roll out at some point. Uh, yeah, I think it's early, early next year for us. Yeah, exactly. So we'll have to wait a little bit and and rely on reviews from from other people. And uh, we're gonna keep talking about streaming, uh, um, but actually take it on a more uh, sort of general company level first, because uh, uh, Beats Electronics uh, uh, has been rumored to be uh, looking at uh, uh, ditching its uh, majority stakeholder HTC in order to find a better funded partner that could help yeah. it progress in uh, different fields like uh, uh, cars, dashboards, consumer electronics, uh, and uh, also help its uh, uh, sort of uh, burgeoning or you know close to launch a music streaming service Daisy and so HTC holds 50.1% of uh, Beats Electronics after pumping uh, 300 million into the company uh, a couple of years ago but aside from an expensive uh, branding exercise of the Beats audio thing on its phones uh, it didn't really take advantage of it uh, that much really you know, you know that, that was pretty much it uh, nothing groundbreaking really and so uh, it, it kind of feels like it, it would make sense for Beats to find a partner that is better suited at implementing its brand and its technology across the spectrum of different things so uh, uh, Andy how do you feel about Beats taking on you know being taken on by Samsung for example would that would that change the game for I think company? yeah I think that's a that's a, 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 a certainly a move I think is sensible because a part, a part of the problem with with HTC is that almost as soon as they did the deal HTC started to lose ground in the mobile market and, and I think that's part of the reason why you've not seen much innovation within within the, this partnership because uh, HTC had other things to worry about, and they already, I think it was last year, they sold, they sold half of their stake back to, H, uh, to Beats right. already. Um, so, I mean, there's no, there's no uh, indication as yet that HTC wants to sell, but obviously, if they've already sold half their stake, that uh, they certainly might be primed to do that. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I think someone, you know, a, a kind of a rising company like like Samsung in the mobile market would be a, would be a, a much better option for them at this stage. And Samsung make all sorts of stuff as well, so they can yeah, incorporate yeah. Beats Audio and TVs and all sorts of stuff. So that could be an interesting thing for them as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Adam, from a PR perspective, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, HTC is a company that is kind of has been going downhill for a couple of years. Profits are razor thin, and they are uh, apparently going to go into loss uh, next quarter. Uh, you know, they're placing lots of lots of you know their bets on this uh, new Robert Downey Jr. Uh, campaign that they've launched uh, uh, to promote the new phone. Uh, so, so do you, do you feel like uh, they may feel vulnerable uh, to giving a brand like Beats away? Uh, you know. Even even provided reasonable compensation is given, uh, and that you know it may, might make them look like they are losing even more ground than they already are. And so, and if that is true, th- sh- should they p- perhaps retain uh, the partnership with Beats and try to stay the course and see if, if things turn around for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I suppose from a, uh, I mean, from a, from an industry perspective, I suppose it, 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 I mean, it doesn't look fantastic to, to. to have the the other partner in your in your partnership what sort of wanting away i suppose um um i mean it'd be i guess it would be it'd be interesting to see to to see i mean if i mean if they do break if they don't break apart it'll be interesting to see what happens between them um say when the streaming service launches or something like that i guess yeah um um but again you know it's uh uh it, it, all, I mean, again, it's all hypothetical until you know until um, until that happens. I, I guess something so. happening, and and uh, staying on staying on Daisy actually, Andy, you you you, you turn me. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Adam, uh, you turned me on to a really interesting piece by Janko uh, at Gigaom. Uh, uh, Janko uh, Rutger is a Gigaom uh, who actually were killing it this week with news. Uh, they had lots of stuff. Uh, and uh, he uncovered some details on the process of playlist curation spearheaded by Daisy, uh, which stated, of course, from the outset that this curation process would be you know, their differenti- differentiating factor from other streaming services. And the company is enlisting both musicians and uh, 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 writers, freelancers, uh, to compile hundreds of playlists on the systems based on specific briefs and while artists have pretty much a free reign uh, uh, freelancers uh, and writers uh, have to stick to a number of regulations given by the company and specifically they should avoid being overly clever with transitions that would be lost on the average listeners they should be you should avoid uh, el- elitism uh, in their music selection and, and avoid talking down to listeners uh, musically I guess and they should also aim to provide the best listening experience within a given context so now this sounds quite harsh when it's read out loud but having worked 
worked in content management myself. I kind of can kind of see where they're coming from. Uh, but uh, I don't know, Andy, do you think that these rules make sense in the context of providing a good experience to listeners, or they kind of reduce the spontaneity of uh, and randomness really of of uh, a human selection that should be what differentiates the service from the others? Well, there's, I mean, uh, to an extent, yes, but I can see where they're going. They're obviously, I mean, yeah. like for, for all these services, the kind of the mainstream users is, is the kind of the holy grail and what, what people really want and need for, for their business models really to succeed. Yeah. Um, and by you know, saying, don't, don't be elitist, don't be confusing, um, I, it, it makes sense if you're trying, if you, you I mean, they said there was, that article said they, you know, they've they've created thousands of playlists trying to focus on specific people and specific moods and moments yeah. and things that they're doing, like you know, barbecuing and whatever. And uh, it, yeah, I think when you're when you're kind of going out in general terms like that, you have to lay t- lay some ground rules down, and uh, you know. It makes sense. I mean, <laughs> Janko was writing that, you know, they don't want any record store sort of geeky clerks in, in to compiling the playlist, but nobody really likes record store geeky clerks, <laughs> <laughs> at least in the mainstream public. They make you feel intimidated and they kind of ask you why you don't know about stuff that you should be knowing about because they know yeah. all about it. And it's kind of... I mean, I mean, I mean, it's a bit of a catch-22 in some ways, though, because I think <laughs> the, in some ways, yeah, the mainstream consumer is, is not the consumer that wants a recommendation. I don't think that much, or they get it from radio. Yeah, and then and then you know people who are music freaks will look at that you know they'll look at that document and just think that's you know that's that's ridiculous. I probably want a bit of you know a bit of high fidelity elitist record clerk to turn me on to you know to turn me on some stuff. I mean, I would yeah. say that in in a way though that you know the competition from other services is so bad at the moment. I, mean, I was looking at the Spotify um, the Spotify playlist thing at the moment. There's there's actually one called Beards and Flannel. Um, and uh, uh, the, even, even, even the images, I mean, they, they look like something you'd get in a sort of a Marks and Spencer's compilation section. I mean, it's, it's really bad. It's, the competition is, 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 is terrible, I think. So. Yeah, I mean, I think another problem with it is, is like you said, most people are going to they're going to get their recommendations from radio and people, particularly mainstream music listeners, they, they, they kind of get the music recommendations passively and it is just mm-hmm. turning on the radio and something new comes on and you, once you've listened to the radio for a week and you've heard it 50 times, you kind of think, oh, I quite like that song. But this, this have, comes from a starting point of people have to go, oh, I'm having a barbecue, I better find a playlist to go and listen to, where actually <laughs> they just want to turn it on and they go, here is some stuff, now listen to it and be quiet. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and I guess like, the, the the music geeks and the, the people that really know their stuff for music are probably also less likely to go and look for playlists because they might already have a big community of people that they turn to to, to get recommendations from. So I guess maybe they are also less likely to to go and look for playlists. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right on that, but yeah, I'll be interested to know what's on a barbecue playlist actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, well, yeah, one size fits all barbecue playlists. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure uh, songs that has several barbecue playlists. <laughs> and they have all sorts of stuff on there. And uh, great. And in the second half of the show, we'll be talking about Bandpage, Gaga's applause, SoundCloud, audio, and more. But first, we'll f- we'll take a short ad break featuring this week's sponsor of Digital Music Trends, a media law firm, Sheridan's. <laughs> I'm here with Tahir Bashir from uh, Sheridan's uh, and we're going to talk about uh, lawyers and artists today. So what is uh, a law firm's role in an artist's career? Well, uh, l- lawyers in, in the music industry are different to lawyers in other industries because uh, typically lawyers in the music industry tend to get more involved in the career of the, of the talent, whereas lawyers in other industries are they're pe- effectively looking at problems and contracts. Yeah. So uh, in the music industry, lawyers act as not just legal uh, advisors, but also as business consultants, effectively. Yeah, sure. And so in a way, the, the work of a lawyer complements that of a manager. And if so, in, in, in what way? We work very closely with managers where an artist has a manager, so uh, typically the manager will be talking about a particular deal or look for for, for deals and then will consult with the lawyer as to the deal terms and then the lawyer helps execute the deal with the manager. In some cases we have more of a uh, wider angle and uh, understanding of deals because we do so many for different artists, whereas the manager looks after one artist. So that that helps managers. Uh, And in other cases, some some artists don't have managers. So in those scenarios, the lawyers act uh, as pseudo managers as well. Yeah, sure. And looking at uh, the relationship with labels as well, uh, do you provide contacts with labels too if artists come to you? 
Yeah, I mean, realistically, you know, we we don't go out and uh, sh shop deals as much as managers do because yeah. that's their job. Having said that, um, we uh, have very close relationships with labels. Um, you, they get to know you very well because they do so many deals with you. Uh, they look to you to close deals so that, so, so that you have a, a different uh, role in their eyes. And quite often, if they know that you're, you know, you act for various artists and we act for probably more artists here at Sheridan's than you know, any other law firm in the UK, they know that you've got good quality artists on your books, so they, they're looking to build business as well. So um, quite often we're used as a filtering process for, for new artists. Sure. And finally, a question that is, uh, I think, in everybody's mind in terms of uh, emerging artists. When uh, is the right time to go and speak to a law firm or to a lawyer? Yeah, uh, I mean, as an emerging artist, the first thing you need to do is make sure that your music is as good as it can be. It's, it's all about the creativity. Uh, there comes a time when you need to speak to a lawyer, uh, and that time can vary for different artists. Obviously, the best time is if you've got a deal in place, because at that point, you do need someone to advise you around that. Sometimes with some artists, they need a bit of guidance as to how to go approach things. And so, you know, I do speak to artists earlier, um, you know, and in, with some artists' case, you know, very early. Um, but ultimately, it will be at the point that they've got something in place where they want to, you know, sign up to something. That's great. Thank you very much. And until next week. And now a story about Banpage that Andy, you covered on CMU as well. So Banpage has transformed over the past year into the Swiss knife of uh, bands or widgets. And I hope that uh, sort of uh, translator makes any sense as a metaphor. But it announced a partnership with Vivo and Xbox Music recently. They will see the company feed updated information from its own widgets uh, onto those uh, uh, sites uh, when users uh, are listening and uh, looking at music from those particular artists. So that's, uh, uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, evolution of the service uh, and it could be a big win for Bandpage and for artists as well if Bandpage can become that centralized space that bands can update in, in the confidence that it will spread across the internet and they won't have to go to 30 different places to, to update the data on where they're playing or the bio or the latest release and, and so uh, I love the fact that they turned it around like in that sense they, they really managed to they, they appear to manage to stay relevant in, in, in a world that is uh, ever more fragmented in terms of services and I would love to see more services integrate that kind of info because then you could actually know what the artist is up to when you're listening to a record. Uh, uh, Andy, do you feel like this this is a good strategy and, and can, it, can it pay off for, for Bampage? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, they're a really interesting company because it's not that long ago that, you know, the, the last time Facebook updated its fan pages and everyone predicted Bandpage's death yeah. when that happened. And they have really turned it around and I think it is a, a, a really useful service. I mean, it's not, the, the, the information they're providing to Xbox Music and Vivo isn't a, a huge amount of info. It's mainly kind yeah. of biography and tour dates but uh but that's a start i mean th that could expand into other other information yeah. but there is you know if you're an artist now there are, there are a lot of services you need to manage and stay on top of and having one that sits in the middle and will automatically update all your information on everything for you is a really useful service and one i think you know people want and will use yeah yeah and uh, Adam, you know, of course, uh, it seems like a good idea and uh, it'd be great if that information, for example, fed into Spotify as well. I don't see why there would be a problem. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the one thing that was, I guess that was the one thing I did read um, that, that seemed to be a bit of a stumbling block was that the, in terms of Vivo, it's not going to run across YouTube, is that correct? Well, no. Like was, yeah, so I guess that, I guess that some of those roadblocks may be quite, quite challenging, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I guess uh, uh, Google probably want to do a deal directly with with the company in order to display sure, that information sure. and uh, and that's quite a, a tough call because Google is such a huge company and yeah. <laughs> to take take a plunge on a company that is still relatively small like Bandpage is going to take a little a little bit longer. Sure. What's well, so, I mean I, I mean I'm, I mean I know a, a, a bit about Bandpage probably less than you two guys but I mean what's what's the what's the the sort of the the, the business model? Well, essentially, it's a it's a oh the business model oh that's that's a good one, Andy. <laughs> 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 oh, the business model. Um, you, know, you know that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would have to get back to you on that one. I'm sure that I, 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 I had some sense of what it was, but I can't actually detail it to you right now. I, mean, I don't know whether I mean, at this stage, I think they're still they're still kind of growing the idea and, and, and picking up users, as you know is so often the case with these things, and probably running through VC money. Yeah. Um, and there's also I think there's I a premium the option as well. There's a premium option as well, so you can yeah, you can get more so features. The premium if option would yeah. be the obvious, you know, say like you can update your biographies 
with the free option, I don't know what their their premium option is, but you know, whether yeah. like if you could actually distribute music yeah. via a paid option, that. But there's a clear data play as well, like in this. If they can expand to have their API serve a bunch of different services, then there's a there's a definite data play in and potential money involved in that analytics and and other stuff. So yeah, interesting to see how they will how they will take that. Because uh, of course, you know, they've been around for a while now, so I'm sure the VCs are gonna want to start seeing a return pretty pretty sharpish at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, I, I wish them all, all, all the luck because uh, I, I like the idea and I, and I want something like that to succeed and, and actually expand. And uh, and the big story of last week was uh, Lady Gaga. So we can't not talk about Lady Gaga <laughs> this week because uh, last week I had a best of show. So we didn't actually talk about the news. And, uh, uh, you know, the star was subject to a leak 10 days ago. And that was uh, regarding the new single Applause. It started circulating uh, last Saturday. So it's about, about 10 days ago. Uh, shortly after the pop Star started posting a series of tweets uh, starting with uh, Lord in heaven why uh, you just couldn't wait uh, this is too much for one Saturday and all this kind of stuff and then Universal Music stepped in and they started working on the uh, Stars app uh, to release an appeal for fans to actually go and post uh, on their Universal Music uh, uh, site uh, leaks and and, um, and, pirates, and pirate links uh, which was uh, quite an interesting move because it was uh, 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 as far as I know the first time that a worldwide megastar issued an appeal of this kind to, to its fans uh, since they steer away from piracy like uh, like uh, cats with water and uh, um, at least talking about piracy and uh, one fan posted uh, that they you know they emailed uh, 12 links to universal music one fan posted the email uh, 50 links to universal music so it seemed like the fans actually took to this and, and were trying to defend the, the pop star and then uh, gaga uh, released the single uh, finally uh, on on the monday uh, and uh, since then uh, the single has been out uh, about uh, n n nine days uh, t uh, today, and according to Nielsen SoundScan, it's not selling particularly well, especially compared to uh, uh, Katy Perry's Roar. So first of all, let's talk about the first part of the story. So uh, what do you make of Gaga's reaction, uh, Adam? And do you feel like, uh, how, how is she confident enough to appeal uh, on anti-piracy thing with her fan base without uh, fearing a backlash because that that's really has been the big thing for artists in the last uh, few years uh, following Metallica's uh, disaster with with Napster well I mean, I mean I think one one of the I mean I think one of the I mean obviously yeah, you know I mean I mean leaks are leaks and it's and it's uh, unless it's a sort of a a David Bowie sort of um, um, sort of catching everybody off guard approach. You know, there, there's an expectancy that, that you know that, 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 that stuff will leak. And I think one of the, one, one of the interesting things from an artist's perspective, I think, is that quite often with um, with piracy or however you want to term it, you know, it's the obviously the the loss of revenues is an issue. But I think it's the the, the control, particularly around you know the actual release of your thing that you've been working on for months, maybe years. That's one of the most important things and how it's presented and. I guess traditionally that was the moment of excitement that was, you know, that was monetized by the music industry. So I, I guess I can understand artists getting pissed off, and because it's not a because it's not a a call to your fans that that, um, that you know you're losing money or something. And obviously, Lady Gaga is probably not short of a few bob. So so I, I guess that that's that creates more of a tension and more of a backlash. But I yeah. think if it's more about you know this 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 thing that you you know it's just like you know why couldn't you just wait another week. Yeah. I, I, I guess it sort of softens it, and again, you know, you've seen other artists in the past. I mean, even even when you've got bands like Elbow who are sort of saying, you know, we want to release our albums not as single tracks, but as a, you know, but as an album. You know, I can sort of, I think people can maybe understand that more from an artist's perspective that you know yeah. they want to have some say in terms of how their how their work is um, unleashed on the world. Yeah, so it makes sense from a, from a timing perspective to do this with uh, with fans because they'd be more appreciative of the fact that you're annoyed about the release coming out. And and uh, uh, Andy, in terms of the timing, you know, the release wasn't supposed to come out for another week, so it was supposed to come out today, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, Katy Perry apparently in the US has uh, doubled down on Gaga, uh, selling over half a million copies of her single Roar, uh, whilst Gaga, who had to rush release the single, has been stuck at about 200 to 225,000, according to uh, the reported numbers. Uh, we don't have anything official as of yet. It will probably come out today. Uh, what, do you feel like Gaga may have lost sales uh, as a result of this, or is it just the fact that the public didn't take on to the track too much? I don't know. I think um, Lady Gaga and her fans are both fascinating. And I've been kind of doing a lot of reading and just following things on Twitter. And, and uh, her, own, I mean, she has her, her, her fans are possibly the most militant kind of uh, 
I'm not going to say sycophantic because I don't want you to get hate mail. <laughs> but, uh, you know, her, her fans are, are incredibly fanish. Yeah. Um, it's like a cult, essentially. Yeah. yeah, it is a bit. I mean, they have their own social network, littlemonsters.com, yeah. which is a very, very strange place to be. Uh, and, and, uh, and she, but she, they, 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 she has so many people who kind of hang on her every word that when she comes out and says, why couldn't you wait? There's those people, it's not necessarily kind of a call to arms and, 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 and kind of sending her fans out to do her bidding. It's more just, she's got a lot of fans who are there ready to do anything they think will please her. Yeah. Um, and she had been, I mean, she'd be, she was doing like a three week countdown to the single release, like a different hashtag every day. It started at like 24 days to applause, I think. And it was, I think she was at nine days to applause and then it leaked. Yeah. And she was yeah. like, but, well, that's just ruined. The All these department. hashtags I had, I'm just going to you know, leave them <laughs> hanging around, not being used now. <laughs> the marketing <laughs> department made yeah. up for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, but then in t- but th- so there's that. So it kind of on the face of it, I think it, it sort of appears that she has this huge fan base ready to go out and buy, buy anything she does. And this week we've seen them uh, doing things, slightly dubious things to kind of up the play counts on YouTube and Vivo and places um, to make the single appear more popular. Um, but in terms of kind of the wider public, I think one people are, people who see her fans acting like that are kind of a bit put off by the whole weirdness of it. And also, she has gone. I mean, as much as she's tried to play down the rivalry, she has ended up going up against Katy Perry, and and a lot of people just think Katy Perry has the better soul. Yeah. Um, and while Katy Perry has similarly kind of quite scary fans. They're not quite as scary as God. <laughs> and also Lady Gaga uh, started a feud with Paris Hilton that probably doesn't help because uh, he's quite a, the powerful yeah, one, isn't he? That was just weird. In the US, that was weird as well. So, yeah. It just didn't, didn't seem to have started with the best uh, of, uh, I don't know, under the best stars. I think as well, the, the other problem with it is that, is that, and I think it's the same problem that Lady Gaga had for their last album, is that she talks it up as being like, this incredible art, Work and she presents art, yeah. herself as kind of like a, a super artist, a kind of a more than a pop star. Yeah. And then she releases something that's a pretty standard pop track. It's not, and so like you kind of, you've been waiting for this amazing thing that yeah. she's been talking about for months. And then suddenly it comes out and you're like, oh, that's, well, that just sounds like being a yeah. pop. As, hasn't her act been sort of, you know, this sort of all singing, all dancing act, that this has been sort of toned down now as well. And, and, yeah. and, and it's not, not going to be quite as... Uh, not quite as sort of uh, uh, amazing as first uh, <laughs> as first um, suggested. Obviously, Kate, Katy Perry had a big gold truck as well, didn't she? Which made yeah, yeah, well. which uh, crashed. Yeah. It did yeah. crash. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is like a really bad version of like the Oasis versus Blur thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know whether. I mean, I mean, if, if the Lady Gaga thing is is totally legit and and you know it's all rush release. I mean, obviously that may have affected you know how it was being presented to radio and all the rest yeah. of it. So I guess that that. Yeah, in terms of the, the the release plan, it may have had a you know it may have had an adverse effect. But I think Andy's right; it's probably I mean, it comes down to what you know what tune do the public prefer, I guess, really, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it's going to be super interesting to see how the album release plays out. Whether there are leaks uh, on the album front on either camp, either Katy Perry's or Lady Gaga's. I think they're coming out two or three weeks apart. Um, so yeah. We're gonna keep an eye on that one, and, and definitely, I, I would actually give more props to, to Gaga for the for the visual uh, aspect of the video that I saw to, uh, saw today. Yeah, that looks pretty awesome, uh, as opposed to the actual track, which is. I, cool. I mean, I mean, you would think with her as well that she'd have she'd have more scope to do, you know, to, to maybe have a more interesting release of the album. Anyway, I mean, she has got this social network. I mean, you know, you'd almost think it's a bit of a waste just to go through a a fairly traditional plot of releasing a record. I mean, she's already releasing an album, and she's got. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of th- you know interesting things she could possibly do in terms of releasing that record. So I think it'd be you know be a bit of a missed opportunity if it was just a you know appearance on David Letterman and a you know exclusive stream on iTunes or something. I yeah. think that would be quite disappointing, really. So. But then again, you, we've seen the results that uh, Justin Timberlake had in sticking to a wholly traditional campaign earlier this year and selling uh, close to a million records in the first week. So uh, I think that that may have been a bit of a wake-up call to some artists that just wanted to do experimental stuff to think, oh, well, actually, if I stick to the, to the traditional route uh, with my <laughs> major label, then I might actually get better results than if I start doing yeah, experimental yeah, yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. online. But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's going to be quite interesting. And uh, 
what else? So uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, SoundCloud story. So SoundCloud announced a Google Plus integration uh, last week. They will enable users to post the tracks on their uh, Google Plus profiles, uh, and they will be playable directly uh, from the widget without having to uh, change page. So pretty straightforward story, really. A new partnership for SoundCloud, uh, a big audience in Google Plus, uh, and uh, an interesting direct access uh, like like the one they had on Twitter uh, several months ago when uh, when SoundCloud integrated into Twitter and you could play tracks directly from there when you posted them on. And so how important is direct access like the one provided on Google Plus and that's the fact that uh, Google has been pretty closed off uh, up to now with G Plus uh, but it did allow SoundCloud to integrate uh, what does that speak uh, in terms of you know SoundCloud's influence and SoundCloud's uh, growing importance in uh, on the internet at large as well Andy I think yeah the fact that uh, that, that SoundCloud's kind of the first company to to do this is is d does certainly say a lot about about where that company is at the moment and and, and who they are and how their importance um it's it's sort of surprising that you couldn't do this stuff already it, it yeah. seems to be kind of such an obvious thing that that you'd expect you know like if, if google plus is really going up against facebook i mean these are just things that you don't really think about when you're using facebook yeah um uh yeah and that Google Plus is just a bit of a nightmare still. I mean, I, yeah. I, I enjoy it, but it's, I still find it hard to use. Uh, and maybe it's just me. But uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I, no, I think it still suffers from, from not being something that grew organically and being, being a service that, although they've made changes to it, kind of a, a service that just kind of was set down and they said, look, there it is, we've made it. Yeah. And, and it actually needed a bit more time to, to kind of, to grow into something that people really wanted. I'm not, yeah. I still, I mean, obviously they, they claim quite big user numbers, but it, I mean, partly that's just because if you've you got a Gmail address, yeah, you've got get, a Google Plus account. If you've got an Android phone, you probably get a G Plus account as yeah. well. So that's, <laughs> And uh, and I mean, for me, it's just a you know, it's just a simple act of sharing a photo. Like they changed from Picasa photos it became now it got migrated to google photos google, google plus photos and just a simple act of sharing an album uh to a bunch of friends became this whole thing and it took me about five tries to, <laughs> to make it work <laughs> and i mean i'm not you know the most technically savvy person but i'm, I'm pretty I'm, you know i'm pretty good <laughs> I think if it takes me so long how long yeah. is it gonna take a, like a, a middle of the road user but uh, i don't know adam uh what, what do you think about soundcloud and and google and uh and uh, where is SoundCloud heading at this point? Um, <laughs> well, the second question is probably a bit, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That was a trick question. <laughs> slightly larger, I think. I mean, I mean, same as Andy, I'm probably quite surprised it's something like that's not there. I mean, I'm, I mean, to me, it doesn't sound like the sort of news that's going to, you know, turn the world on its axis. No. Um, you know, SoundCloud is a fairly, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not as if it's not, it's not, you know, difficult to you find on, 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 on the web or, or ever present or anything. Um, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of some of the other conversations we've been having around, you know, Spotify and Beats, and, and you know, where where SoundCloud is in the market, and you know, pre pre you know, presumably, again, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not making loads of money, but presumably, you know, it has to at some stage to um, to um, um, you know appease investors. So, I mean, it, I mean, all these things are, you know, it's, it's interesting in this whole sort of streaming market, and yeah. um, you know. How, how, I mean, I think even how it's been, even how it's being used in terms of um, pre-release promos and things like that. I mean, that that for me has been quite another interesting thing this week. There was another article you sent um, 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 through Andrea, and it was uh, was it the Gigaroom? I can't remember where it, where it, which, which source it was from, but um, talking about why um, RDO and Spotify don't become record labels and, right. and, yeah. and releasing sort of exclusives and so on. Which again, I think is a really you know it's a really quite big issue at the moment because. Obviously, a lot of those, a lot of the streaming services are going to try and demand exclusivity of the kind that iTunes get with Daft Punk albums and David Bowie albums, yeah. because that's the, that's the kind of thing that drives um, that drives traffic. I think things like that will obviously have an impact on SoundCloud as well. I mean, obviously, at the moment, it's quite typical to, you know, click on the Guardian and they've got a SoundCloud, um, you know, in, embedded player to hear an album, uh, you know, a week early or something. But whether that will become quite so easy, or whether labels will want to do that with them in the future, will be. I guess, I, guess, I guess interesting to know. Yeah, they're kind of this big sleeping giant of this whole streaming debate because uh, they are one of the largest players. But uh, because nobody knows what they're going to do, then 
we can't really speculate on what's going to happen yeah, in the next few months. Yeah, yeah, so. and I, I think even within the whole, you know, the sort of the 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 the, the, the Tom York Spotify debate of the other week. I mean, it's you know, it, 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 it's sort of funny in a way that there was so little attention turned to YouTube and, and SoundCloud within that debate. Obviously, there's one platform that says, you know, that says it's a, a promotional tool and doesn't pay anything, and one of them that is, you know, in fairly grey areas in terms of licensing. And I did, you know, went on yesterday, and the Atoms of Peace album is there in its entirety on YouTube. And it's, yeah, the, the, these these are areas which will be, you know, which will be quite interesting going forward because I think there will be a lot more competition for, you know, for exclusivity and for pre-releases and things like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you were talking about audio. Actually, there was a, a, an interesting uh, development uh, uh, last week. Uh, you know, all the services. You know, we're having press releases left, right, and center, really, uh, about services that are trying to up upgrade their 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 streaming service to make it competitive with a variety of uh, potential threats, which could be Pandora, it could be uh, Songs, it could be you know a new feature on Spotify, and uh, and you know Apple's iRadio, of course, is uh, something that a lot of people are keeping their eyes on, and. And last week, Audio uh, decided to step up its internet radio presence uh, by introducing the Stations tab, which uh, opens up hundreds of genre stations to its users. Uh, but the most interesting parts are actually a personalized uh, U station, which combines your music listening ta uh, history with uh, your Facebook likes and your Twitter follows and everything like that um, to create a unique experience. Uh, and uh, you can actually tune in to other people's uh, U uh, uh, U stations so you could uh, find my U station or audio and, and listen to that if you wanted to to share what i'm into which is interesting for influencers i guess and you can also go into uh, a heavy rotation playlist which gives you access to uh, a playlist of uh, what your friends are listening to uh, the most uh, right now so that's another interesting point I, I mean i like it it's kind of a fresh perspective on on internet radio although i don't know how well it works because I, I haven't tried it yet uh, i don't know do you like the, these ideas uh, Andy? and uh, how, how do you feel they play out in the wider in the wider you know perspective of trying to keep users uh, where they are uh, no, i mean in, in theory i guess i like the idea of i mean if it, if it really worked yeah and obviously, really worked, i mean they're yeah. not they're not the they're not the first company to launch like a personalized thing based on your oh. you know your listening habits um and i think they're things that I don't know. Uh, those things always seem like you kind of play with them a bit to start with, and you think oh, that's cool, and then and then don't. And it's that same problem again of like it, it kind of requires you to go and say, oh, I want I want to uh, get some recommendations rather than just having recommendations presented to you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Like I, I haven't tried it, so I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe yeah, it's okay. amazing, but but none of those you know I've none of those things really draw me in. I can see why they're appealing to, to the streaming companies because obviously you pay a lower royalty on uh, on a radio service than you do than you do on demand. But um, but whether people actually want to use those f those features is another thing. It's another thing. Uh, Adam, do, do you feel like that this could keep users where they are? Because I mean, I don't think they're going to gain the company users. It's more a question of retaining the ones that they've already got. Through these added added value services, yeah. Right? I, I, I mean, again, I mean, I think you know between yeah between particularly audio, Spotify, Deezer, Rhapsody. I mean, they're they you know that uh, I, I think increasingly the competition will come to you know the kind of content that they've got and licensed. And again, as as much as the functionalities, I think because I think you know essentially at the moment they've got a similar content, similar price point, pretty similar functionalities. You know, not not a whole heap of difference. Yeah. Maybe there's a bit more of editorial on a service like Deezer or something, but. Um, and again, I think that that's. I mean, for me, that this is it's, it's a really interesting area. I think, and that again, this week, something like NPR in the states has you know exclusive streams of six or seven new release albums. You know, a week or two weeks early or something. You know, as as somebody who pays every month for for Spotify as a premium user, you know, I, I, I do start to ask myself, shouldn't I be getting super served some of this stuff for my subscription? Really, yeah. um, when and, and 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 equally, you know, it's, it seems it seems a bit strange that it's just. You know, and, and SNPR are paying you know big big fees to get those um, get those streams exclusively. It seems it seems strange that it's not being monetized as well. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know. It says the Spotify did used to have uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah they did you know, uh, uh, you know preview streams for for subscribers, and they seem to have. I haven't seen any. Stop doing any that. Of that yeah, uh, I, 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 I think they had they had the last U two album, isn't it? I think that that album was so terrible that basically, <laughs> if it, if it, if it put them off, the I think possibly. <laughs> but, um, but but they did. But they did at some point. I can remember they had. Uh, I think the last Streets album they had a week early and stuff. And again, that it, it's quite curious to me why why that isn't the case because it's something. I, I mean, personally, I definitely pay a bit more for for knowing I was getting something. You know, a week 
two weeks early. And I've had, you know, artists, I bought things on Bandcamp for, uh, before, you know, they've sent me a link to the album before release that and stuff. I don't know, it's, it's that kind of stuff which, which seems to me quite valuable, really, and that I probably paid beyond £9.99 a month or something. So. The problem is a, is a question of numbers, because if we're talking about exclusive previews for premium subscribers, that really narrows it down to a very small segment of the, of the music f- fan base. And so it means that the artist is automatically reducing its own exposure to of the album prior to the release. I mean, if you were talking about all Spotify users, maybe that mm. would be more interesting. But if you're talking just, just about a few million people, as opposed to the number of people that could listen to it on the NPR website for free or on the iTunes streaming for free, then, I don't know, in the numbers war, if I was a manager, I would, I would pick iTunes right now over Spotify because I would know that you know, 100 million more people would be able to listen to this stream instead of just, just a couple or just five or six million. I yeah, know. I don't know. I think it's maybe it's slight chicken and egg, I think, as well. I think yeah. if they, you know, it would obviously, if you had a streaming service and you were getting those exclusives, presumably you may start to attract more, you know, more users. And obviously they're, they're paying users as well, which are yeah. gold dust, I guess, in these, uh, in these straight times. Yeah, definitely, definitely a chicken and egg situation for sure. Uh, I think until until iTunes doesn't start dropping off quite significantly, we're going to keep seeing a lot of uh, reviews on iTunes. <laughs> sure. I've got a feeling. And uh, uh, there was an Oddball story of the week, which is amazing. I love Oddball, oddball stories. And, and that's Virgin Atlantic aiming to shake up domestic flights in the UK with its uh, little red flights, uh, which are going to provide... Uh, um, live entertainment uh, with stand-up and bands to unsuspecting customers. So I love the idea, but I would probably hate to be on one of the flights that is doing this, unless I was going on holiday or something. Uh, what, what's your take, uh, Adam? Uh, it's pretty bad when a busker gets on the tube, isn't it, with you? But, but um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be a fan, I must say, personally. Andy? Yeah, I think, I mean, it obviously, it, it, it seems a bit gimmicky and a kind of a thing to get press coverage more than I mean it's like you, I don't know like imagine that you're on a busy flight and someone some comedian you don't find funny gets up and talks for the entire time you're on the plane yeah. that's not that's not any fun I don't think I'd fly with them again <laughs> and people fly for all sorts of reasons I mean it can be business it can be family you can have like a family tragedy or disaster you know it's you don't really want to impose like any specific type of entertainment on, on people and unless maybe like you were running it through the headphone system headset system in the plane instead of running it through speakers and then i guess you could not listen to it yeah, yeah it sort of feels like the thing that ryan ryanair maybe might do before virgin <laughs> or something <laughs> no ryanair would, would would loathe having to pay for the the weight of the guitars and <laughs> it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be pay to play obviously with ryanair but yeah. <laughs> That have like a really bad comedian strapped to the ceiling of the plane, <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't occupy floor space. <laughs> but there is, but there is a, a. I mean, I think I think Jamiroquai did a gig, didn't he, once in the in in a, in a in a in an aeroplane. I'm sure I'm sure some other artists have done, you know, sort of uh, one-off promotional gigs or charity gigs in um, yeah in, in, in aircraft. I think so. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense if you're gathering the fan base of a specific artist or a comedian and you're doing that on on purpose. But if you just get random people to go on random flights. It just seems really bizarre. I mean, I would have yeah. loved to be have been on the Iron Maiden flight thing. That was amazing. Like yeah. flying with Bruce Dickinson to one of the Iron Maiden gigs. But then you've got Rihanna on the other hand, haven't you? As well. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, last story for today is uh, uh, Google Play Musical Access launching in the UK and a number of other European markets, including Austria, Belgium, France, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, uh, Portugal, and Spain uh, last week. And I thought this was great, a great news until I uh, remembered, not realized, but remembered straight after signing up that they don't have an iOS app yet. And so uh, <laughs> has either of you tried it out yet? No. <laughs> no, no, and uh, uh, I know uh, Sam, who works here, has has signed up for it, but uh, and and he did that specifically because he's on Android, and you know you get the kind of integration that that maybe you know you get with the, with iTunes on the on on the iPhone. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I can see, I can totally see the the attraction of that, um, but but I think it's it's only something I would sign up for if I was to go over to Android. I think. Yeah, and do you think in that sense is it's is the same play as a uh, as Apple probably not releasing an iTunes radio app for Android in the sense that Android is trying to keep its users where they are? Or? Yeah, I mean, obviously they're trying to, you know, it's, it's an added value thing. Um, but, but I think where this is 
maybe a disadvantage to to Apple is that obviously people who bought iPhones have generally kind of already been using uh, iTunes and and they're kind of familiar with it and they just you know they kind of their music will, will be loaded onto their phone without them even really knowing what's happening and you kind of just go oh that's exciting whereas something like you know where where, where something like this doesn't have that kind of legacy to it um, and it it's something that people have to kind of go out and go right I thought I need to set this up and sort you it out you have to give your credit card details and yeah yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. It would have been interesting to see Google start with a, a radio service like Apple, because that would have been huge, mm. considering the hundreds of millions of Android phones they have out there. But I guess they went another way. Uh, unless they unveil something with YouTube, that, that, that would be fun. Yeah. Especially with the new playlist thing. That's, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the new uh, mobile app for YouTube. And, no, I've downloaded uh, it. I've not opened it yet. And now you can uh, play a whole playlist of videos and also do search while you're watching videos so it kind of opens up a whole new mm. realm of possibilities when you're doing stuff on, on uh, YouTube. I, I mean again I think this goes back to what we're saying about um, you know about having content I mean that's this is almost the sort of like an interesting dilemma for Google in that they, they also yeah. they want to enter the streaming market because they want people in, in in their cloud and buying their devices and operating systems but you know obviously YouTube, YouTube has you know pretty much every every piece of content known to man and you know I had a situation yesterday where I was uh, Wanting to play a new order album, which I had on vinyl, uh, went to Spotify. wasn't on Spotify, but you know the full album is there on is there on YouTube, and it's you know you click and play, and and it gets, it's all these slightly grey areas. Uh, yeah. I don't know. It's uh, uh, and, and yeah, presumably that new order album won't be on um, won't be on the Google Play service or something. So exactly. And by the way, hats off to Google Play because uh, they launched in so many territories in the space of like three four months. So that, that's mm -hmm. that's a nightmare. I mean, I, I've dealt with content before and. Licensing that many territories in that short of a space of time has, must have required quite a quite a an effort in terms of human resources as well. So <laughs> hats off to them for that. And and uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Uh, well, it was an absolute pleasure having you both on the show. And I want to ask you both, uh, what are you up to? And if there's anything that you want to plug, uh, Adam, first uh, uh, first up. Uh, anything to plug? Nothing to plug at the moment. Um, I'm working on a few PR projects, but I'm not at liberty to talk about them. <laughs> Ah, fun. Great. Uh, Andy, uh, anything on, on the CMU front? Well, I guess uh, at the moment, it's, it's, this is the, the quiet period at the moment in, in August, so just kind of carrying on as usual. But, you know, anyone who's watching who doesn't sign up to CMU daily, Absolutely. then I, I would really recommend you do that yeah, and get and your also, daily dose of everything that's happening in the music industry. And also Andy and Chris have a great podcast on CMU as well, so you can check that out too. Uh, to add to your daily commute, uh, which is yeah. great, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely, I would recommend the CMU Daily. It's a, it's a great read. And thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. And thanks so much for listening today. If you enjoy the show, I would love if you could show your appreciation by passing it on to one more person in your network today. That would really be uh, helpful. And if you could leave a, a review on iTunes, that would also be uh, absolutely great. Uh, thanks uh, so much for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.